Welcome to Candid Leadership. Today, we have the privilege to speak with Mel Kepler, who is a training consultant and a Gallup Certified Strength Coach. She's worked in marketing and communications at the Office of the Director of National Intelligence. She worked in government for over 13 years in a variety of positions, including in the White House Situation Room, as a staff officer, an intelligence analyst, a tradecraft specialist, and an HR professional. She founded the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency Parents Network during her time at that agency. She is a training consultant and facilitator, not only a strength coach and a certified cultural facilitator. And lastly, she has got an incredible energy and desire to inspire. So today, enjoy our conversation on candid leadership, and it's great to have Mel Kepler join with us today. Thank you for joining me on Candid Leadership, Mel. It's great to have you. No problem. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm really excited. So you've written in GovLoop, Mm -hmm. written prolifically about really leading from where you're at. Could you kind of take us down why you like to tackle that subject? Oh, yeah, absolutely. For personal reasons, uh, Candice, honestly, I like to tackle that subject because as I like to almost brag about at this point, until this year... I'm sorry, 2020, until 2020, I had never been given a position of power. Everything that I had ever led or been in charge of was due to my MO of finding a vacuum of power and stepping into it, seeing something that needed to happen and just kind of doing it and then going from there. And so I really, I love and firmly believe in the idea that leadership is is a muscle that you flex. It's something that you just do. It's not necessarily linked to a position of power. But, but, and there's a huge but here, because this is really popular now to say that leadership, lead from where you are, lead from everywhere, leading from the middle, um, it's all over the place. And I would get frustrated at about probably 10 years into my career, I would get frustrated by that. Because I was, you know, I was leading from where I was. I was a band three GS 11 and I was doing everything I could to lead positions, but don't tell me to lead from where I am while also directly and actively quashing every idea I have. And as I said in my article on GovLoop, uh, sometimes it doesn't matter how right I am or how inspiring I am or how good a leader I am if every single thing I'm leading is immediately crushed by someone two levels above me. No, and I think that's a great point about the frustration that sometimes when we're in the midst of really working to create something, you feel the weight of the world on your shoulders. And so by tackling things in that respect, you really started to make change. And and that's why I just, I am always encouraged by your writing when I see it come out. You have held so many different positions and you also talk to followership. And so you, yes. you kind of, in defense of followers, the smart, the independent ones who strive to be, can you kind of go down that lane? Because I just think it's really, really inspirational how you talk to that. I completely credit one of my coworkers back when I was in the DNI Chief Human Capital Office gave me an article that is pretty old. It's from the 80s. It's a Harvard Business Review article called, I believe it's In Defense of Followers. And that article made the point, which I have embraced ever since, that you're not always a leader. Sometimes you don't need to be in charge of something because someone's already doing it. Someone's already in charge, right? So what do you do when you're not the leader? Well, you need to be a good follower. And it talks about followers in these very beautiful, complimentary, inspirational words. Followers aren't sheep. They're not dumber than you. They're not less than the leader. At any given point in our careers, we're all going to be leaders and we're all going to be followers. And frankly, we're all going to be followers a lot more often. So the qualities of a good follower, someone who's independent-minded, not afraid to speak truth to power, is committed to something bigger than themselves, a mission or an idea. I really love this picture of the importance of followers and good followers. And I think we've all in our careers, seen the problem of having bad followers, right? We've all seen people who surround themselves with yes men, not that it's gendered, yes men come in all genders, but people who surround themselves with those that are just going to say, oh yeah, good idea, great work, boss. And you see it with celebrities where you're like, why didn't anyone tell him, don't do that? That's a really bad idea. And it's because they didn't have good followers. So you want to be a good follower when you are a good follower, in part because the people you're leading 
uh, because the people you're following, you're going to be leading someday and you want them to be good followers back to you. That is a phenomenal point you just made about, you know, really positions change quite often. And, and working in a hierarchical structure, you've gone from a very linear environment that you've worked in into a, almost a very collaborative environment. And one, <laughs> yeah. one thing you've written about is really kind of the praise of grinders, not just a sandwich, uh, for those of you that understand what a grinder is elsewhere in America, but also in praise of the people <laughs> that are just, they're doing it, they're getting it done. And you've talked about like having a purpose with a capital P. It's so cool. Could you kind of dig into that? Oh, absolutely. I love this. So, okay. So first of all, as someone who is personally not a grinder, I surround myself with grinders because you know what grinders do? They get work done. They get a lot done. Whatever it is, their tasks that are set in front of them, they crank through them. And so one of the things, this came from the idea I had, I chatted with a coworker. We were in the exact same position. And she said to me, Mel, my ideal job would be one where every day I go in and I turn on my little light on my desk and I have an inbox and an outbox. And all day long, I take things out of my inbox and I do them and I put them in my outbox. And then at the end of the day, I turn off my little light and I go home. And I remember looking at her and being like, wow, the degree to which that is not what I want is staggering. And it really reinforced that this is someone whose work I valued. I loved working with her. Sonia, if you're listening to this, I'm so glad I got to meet you. I loved working with her, but we just wanted very different things. And so often rewards in the workplace are set up for people like me, people who want to go for glory, right? Uh, people who want to get promoted. But the fact is there's a lot of different reasons people want to get promoted. More money, more responsibility, greater scope of influence, bigger titles. And the difficulty comes when the only way to get something like an increase in salary or a certain level of responsibility is by getting promoted because sometimes people end up getting a lot of things they don't want to, like moved out of the job they're in. The thing I've noticed about grinders is they want to, they're often happy where they are, or there is a place where they could be happy sitting in that desk till they retired. And you know, why shouldn't they get to? Why shouldn't they get to go there? And there's still ways to help them grow. Maybe they want to learn to do what they do faster or more efficiently, or the, they want to learn the newest technology for whatever thing it is that they do, or they want to do that thing for a different audience. Who knows? But you can't reward your grinders with things that take them out of their sweet spot. And just like you're not always a leader, I don't think you always have to have a capital P purpose. You don't always have to be going for some giant, thing that you're going to want put on your Wikipedia page or on your tombstone. Sometimes it's fine to just be like, I'm going to, today I'm going to fix six air conditioners and that's what I'll do with my day. And that'll make six houses cooler. And that's enough. That's good. And why not? Why shouldn't it be like that? I think that's fantastic. And, and I think it really speaks to sometimes you really stretch yourself and sometimes you're like, I am digging what I'm doing. It provides me a significant amount of value and worth. And I don't always have to be reaching out for that next rung. I think that's phenomenal. And the fact that you knew yourself well enough to say, wow, I look at that. I see the contentment there with that person, but I'm very different. And that really goes to like knowing yourself. And Absolutely. you've talked in the past definitely about like leadership being a muscle. Yeah. And so understanding that, it talks really to making change, right? If you're if you're into fitness and you understand mm. that you're going to work out and you know, we have all tried this in different ways over the last year <laughs> and many different methods. I'm sure there are plenty of Peloton users out there that are like, yes, I use different muscles now. But those of us who, you know, for me, I've been a lifelong runner and I just love it. But I do understand that over time, you have to incorporate different activities and different mm -hmm. things to really grow strength. So with leadership being a muscle, how do you kind of see that? How do you apply that to what you do with respect to consulting? I'm going to reach into my background here. I'm a Gallup certified strengths coach. And so I think of things through the lens, lens of strengths, aka Clifton strengths, not, you know, muscles and triceps and biceps. But the fact is, if, if leadership is a muscle, it gets better, it gets stronger when you use it. And the more you use it, the more you have to push it, right? Like you can maybe get a good burn on a workout using five pound muscles for a while, but eventually you get strong enough that that isn't enough, right? You need a, a heavier weight, a different activity. 
the thing that I'm going to pull strengths into here is that authenticity is super important in leadership. Different leaders have different styles because they're different people. We can't all lead the exact same way and we shouldn't. We should be who we are. And the fact is Sue Gordon used to say, the truth has its own sound. And the way that I incorporate that in in my life is thinking of authenticity, thinking of how fake it sounds, how wrong it sounds when you're trying to pretend to be someone else, when you're acting a part, when you're not being true to who you are and leading the way you want to lead. And so if anyone out there is listening and thinking, well, you know, I don't really like I don't have this drive for leadership. I don't really want to. I ask you, do you think of yourself as a behind the throne person? Are you a person who sets up all the plans and makes sure all the data is in the right place and supports the person who's in front of the crowd, in front of the microphone? Because that's a form of leadership too. And it's maybe a form of leadership that's more comfortable and more authentic to who you are. And it's just as necessary as, I mean, maybe someone's got to be in the spotlight, but definitely somebody has to turn on the light. And if no one's operating that spotlight, doesn't matter how much I want to be in it. Someone's got to be able to turn it on, get the audience there, make sure, excuse me, make sure they're in the right frame of mind to listen. And all of those things require different skill sets, different strengths. And you really want to be leaning into what you're best at. Because as Sue used to say, the the truth has its own sound. People can tell when you mean it. Wow. I want to quote that quite often. And I think that's fantastic in the fact that you You have to understand yourself, know your strengths, but also play to that. And understand, I tell people quite often, you also have to really know your weaknesses. Yep. And surround yourself. You've spoken already. Surround yourself with people who can, can help you with that. I know, Mel, from you, and you are a dynamic storyteller. And I use what you've done in the past really as an example. In my line of work, you know, we are often taking a tremendous amount of information and summarizing it into, you know, almost quick data <laughs> pockets and data bursts, right? And I have yeah. to try and get it all in. I spent three years studying this. Let me write you a two paragraph summary of everything I know. That's right. That's right. That's exactly kind of a part of what we do. Oftentimes in national security, definitely in the intelligence community, trying to be as spot on as you can, but as succinctly as you can. But with respect, because your undergrad is in linguistics, can you talk to me a little bit about the importance of storytelling, weaving that tale? Oh, absolutely. To put it in terms uh, that any IC member will recognize, it's about relevance. Relevance. Relevance means that not everything you know is necessary to make this point. And that's where storytelling comes in. Sometimes, and I've actually have noticed this throughout the federal government, there's kind of a bias toward the idea that if I just present you with all of the facts, you will come to the same conclusion I have come to because it's so obvious. It's so completely obvious. And just looking at the landscape of the United States and our political situation right now, it's very clear that's not true. People can look at the same set of information and come to very, very different conclusions. So you need to think about what you want people to do with the information you're giving them and what you want them to know after they read it. And I can't remember the person who said it, but the the quote that I always lean to is that nobody is starved for information anymore. In the year 2021, we all are drowning in information. We have more information than we know what to do with. What we're starved for is time. We don't have time to read it all. So as an intelligence report writer, or as someone who writes any sort of report, your job is to tell a story. Your job is to take the necessary information, figure out what beats you want to hit, what order they need to go in, and what information is necessary to support those beats. Just enough to hold it up, not every single thing you know. And then you need to like kind of put your hands up and back away as if it's a crime scene. Like say what you need to say and just get out. I, I actually wrote a, a report on the, an article on this for college students that I've been passing around to my clients and friends that are in academia to pass on to their college seniors to say like, it's basically like, congrats on graduating. Everything anyone's ever taught you about writing is wrong. Because in undergrad, where we spend most of our time practicing writing, we are taught to write to show what we know. We want to write every single thing we've ever learned about something because someone is looking at that to assess our understanding of a topic. But this is almost the opposite of what we're trying to do in the professional world, which is to write 
so that someone else gets a point across. Not so that we show everything we know, but so that they know what they need to know going forward. Just think about in the professional world, even in government and intelligence, when is the last time a boss told you to make sure you had a minimum number of words in your article? It just it just doesn't happen. We're mostly that is worried. fantastic. That is so true. We're that mostly is, worried about the max, right? That's right. Exactly. It's like, keep it under two pages. You're like, right. oh, okay. Um, this proposal I, can be no more than 10 pages. Right, exactly. And and I know the acquisition community deals with this a lot, especially anybody in sales and marketing is listening to that and, and chuckling right now to say, <laughs> gosh, if I could only fit you know, 50 more words. But simplicity, there's an art to that. And there I think really is. when you talk about storytelling, you you have to weave it so that the listener comes to the same conclusion. That's fantastic. And you also talk about time and the pertinence of valuing that person's time. I have spent many hours um, <laughs> in front of, of people briefing and understanding sometimes that although you've given me a half hour, there's only 20 minutes of valuable information what a gift it is to give someone 10 minutes back of their time. And I know that sounds small, but those of us who are working and clawing away, that's a lot of time to get back. Listen, if you are a government official or anyone and you work with senior executives or to translate to the private sector, C-suite individuals, what you need to understand is giving them back five to 10 minutes of their time is the difference between them eating and not eating. If the person in the meeting before you gave them back 10 minutes of their time, that's enough time for them to scarf a granola bar, grab a drink of water, hit the head, and then they show up to your meeting ready to actually hear you instead of being like, I have to go to the bathroom and I'm so hungry. So give them back that 10 minutes. Senior executives, this is actually, I feel like I'm giving the opposite of my usual speech, Candace, because usually I'm turning to my senior executives that I love and saying, hi, I love you. I'm saying this out of love. I want you to know that you think you're a person, but you're not, you're a senior executive. And that's scary to people. And sometimes people take what you say more seriously or more directly or with less nuance than you would want them to because they're a little bit afraid of you. And meanwhile, you're like, what? My socks don't match. And you know, I'm going to go home tonight and have cat hair all over my pillow because my cat won't stay off the bed. You think of yourself as like a regular person with foibles, but to other people, you're a scary senior executive. Let me flip that message for a minute. <laughs> to, to people who are meeting with high level people, Remember that they're human beings. If you can give them 10 minutes, that's time for them to eat. That's time for them to just sit down and stare at a wall for a few seconds. It's time for them to, to recharge a little bit. And that's a real gift that they'll remember. That's fantastic. And I, and I think each of us, you know, whatever position we're in, we find ourselves in the workplace, you could be intimidating to someone and you don't even recognize it. <laughs> so demonstrating a little bit of humility goes a really long way. And I think, you know, we've talked about this extensively, Mel, of just being genuine, you know, yeah. being yourself and understanding, putting yourself in someone else's shoes. I think another area you've spoken about that I, I have found interest in is really looking at influence instead of power and yeah. how really we're looking at the matter of trust and the importance of that. Do you want to riff on that for a sec? I absolutely do. So influence instead of power and the difference between them is something that, again, as someone who was given her first official, I applied for it and they gave it to me position of power in the year 2020. Uh, and I started working professionally postgraduate 15 years before that. Influence is deeply important subject to me. But influence is an important thing to think about even if you do have a position of power. The classic example that I like to give when I, when I talk about this is if you think about a great president and, you know, when I'm talking to people covered by the Hatch Act, I usually say, let's go 50 years prior to today to keep ourselves out of any hot water. But think of a president whose work you admire, who you think of as a great, of all time great. And then I ask people to say the name of that president. And, you know, I get the same few names again and again. Don't really get a lot of uh, John Tyler. Don't really get a lot of Grover Cleveland. Not a lot of, you know, the, the mustachioed gentleman in the middle there. And I point out to people that every president constitutionally has the same amount of power. The position comes with a certain amount of power, and that's that. What's different is the amount of influence that that person had in that role. How much could they make things happen so that when they executed their power, when they flexed that muscle, everything was in place so that it worked out? Now, thinking about things that way, thinking about power versus influence and trust, trust is a huge part of it. I am a big fan of the thin book of trust 
It is aptly named. It is a quick read, but that basically posits that trust is a four-part assessment. It's four different assessments that one person makes of another person. Do uh, Number one, do they mean what they say? Sincerity. Number two, can they do or do will they do what they say they're going to do? Reliability. Number three, can they do what they say they're going to do? So that's competence. And, and that might come into play with like, cool, you obviously really mean it that you want to improve the problem of lack of promotion for people of color, but also you run the cafeteria. So I'm not entirely sure how you're going to do that, but I, I can tell you mean it. And then the fourth one is care. Do they care about me at all? And each of those four assessments are made in that order from one person to another. And the good news is for, for those of you without positions of formal power, it's one-to-one every time. So the director of your organization is not making gaining trust any faster than you are. They still have to do it one by one, just like you do. They have a bigger microphone, but they're not moving any faster than you are. So you can build trust just as much. Trust or lack of trust can either build or erode influence faster than anything else. Wow, if that isn't timely. I just, <laughs> those four points, they'll, folks, they'll be in the show notes. I, I really want to foot stomp. Um, and jump up and down and, you know, wave my hands wildly at the importance and the criticality of of trust in your environment, wherever you're at, whatever you do. Um, Absolutely. I just can't, I can't say that enough. And, and I think those four points are just spot on. Now you've, you've worked in many different places and some of the kind of examples that you can give, whether it be in the White House Situation <laughs> Room, super cool, whether it's also in the circumstances of just mentoring people and building influence and employee engagement, what are, what are some of the key bits and pieces of advice that you would say as the great storyteller that you are going forward that our audience should grab hold on to? Well, I think definitely remembering that the people around you may stay the same, especially if you stay in the same organization. It's just that the orders might change. Again, that the person you're following might be following you someday. The very first senior executive I worked directly for had uh, seven senior executives who reported directly to her. And she told me early on that three of them she had reported to previously. So uh, things mix around, things move around, but the the people that you find valuable will continue to be around you. So treat them well if you're above them, Watch how they treat you if you're below them. If you do find yourself in a position of leadership, here's point number two, look at who's following you. Look for the difference between yes men and good followers who will be good independent advisors whom you can help out and they can help you out who are leading a cause or who are not necessarily following you, but are following your cause, going for something greater than just themselves. Um, and if you gain or lose followers based on what you do, which you will, that'll happen, right? Look at who they were. Are you losing people that were yes men because you weren't giving them the bonuses that they wanted? Or are you losing people that were good people that were dedicated to the cause and did a lot of work? Uh, who you're losing can be a really good indicator of whether you're still on track for where you want to go. I would also say, pay attention to what you do. Again, knowing that in every moment you may be building or eroding trust. Think about what you promise someone you'll do. Think about um, when you arrive to your meetings, your timeliness, uh, respecting other people's time. Think about whether you withhold information or share it freely. And do those things deliberately. Mean what you do, I guess is what I'm saying. Don't just kind of flail around accidentally flopping into a bunch of different things. Whatever you do, mean it. And then you know that the people who are following you or the people that you follow are, are getting a, an honest broker. You're, you're someone who can be counted on to do what they say and mean what they say. I think that's a great point. And it harkens really to thine own self be true. If you you know what kind of person you are and you tell people, you know, whether you're starting a new job, you're moving from one organization to another. If you explain, hey, this is just, this is my personality. This is what makes me tick. I had one boss recently just say, hey, I just, I don't smile a lot because of, you know, I had a jaw broke once when I was a kid and the condition Ah. of that, right? And then they just kind of grew up in that that frame of mind. And that's the reason why they just look serious all the time. But they, they're they very deliberate in what they do. I had another boss once, man, he kept his cards close to, and it was just so 
difficult to read the room and understand. For someone like you and I, who are both people that brief and tell stories and try to explain things to people, it was really hard to read. So we had to find different avenues of approach, whether it was through reading their emails and the words that they use. The long, you know, this person would just, I used to call it like almost a diatribe every time I got an email back. Usually from seniors, you expect like one or two lines and, and send. I know I, I have the tyranny of the email inbox and so I'm a short email person, but this person was very deliberate. So we knew to get feedback in that manner rather than the face-to-face interactions we have with them. And that's the importance of really understanding where you're at and what you do. Uh, Mel, phenomenal conversation we've had here. Anything else you'd like for us to go to? I know if you could tell us a little bit about your website and where people could find more information out about you. Absolutely, sure. I did have one other, uh, you just reminded me, thinking of your your boss who preferred to communicate via email. I think the most important lesson, and I can't believe I didn't say this earlier, that, that you can learn about yourself is that you're not a default human being. And I say this with great confidence because there is no such thing as a default human being. We are all very different. And so whenever you find yourself in a position of being like, well, obviously that's how you should do it. Like, what, how else would you do it? Like stop and really examine that instinct because the fact that you're thinking that means there is another way to do it. And your the way that you default to doing it is is so instinctive and intuitive to you that you don't even it doesn't even occur to you that it's really an option. So remembering that you're not a default human being and that other people's ways of being are also very, very valid and uh, recognizing those differences. So my website is uh, capitalhumans.com. It's uh, capital-humans, and that's capital with an A, as in Cheerio, Pip Capital, as opposed to the uh, state or state or national capital. And my company is provides coaching, facilitation, and workshops, mostly based around strengths. So Clifton Strengths again. Uh, I have a variety of workshops that I provide for client, uh, for individuals, for teams. I have an affinity group workshop where I can help connect people based on what they're great at across an organization or across organizational boundaries to build networks within an organization that cross internal boundaries. And I really enjoy doing strengths work. My jam is people in the middle of change. So whether you're stuck somewhere, you're stuck in a rut and you want to make change or change has happened to you and you're trying to figure out how to get yourself through it, that is what I love to, that is what I love to do. So um, look out for me in GovLoop and I'm hoping to do a workshop with TendLab in the FamTech circle. So if like family technology apps and technology that help people with, uh, with kids, I'm hoping to do a workshop there on strengths and parenting and work and how those three things intertwine. So look out for that in the near future too. Well, that's awesome. And, and I'll tell you listeners, sometimes you just happen to cross paths with someone <laughs> and you realize like this person's going places and I just want to grab them while, uh, while they're available. So Mel was <laughs> one of those people. She's very dynamic. And I've enjoyed all of the insight that that she's provided for me. And I think she's definitely somebody that's going to make change in the world. And it's awesome to have her here on Candid Leadership. Well, thank you so much for bringing me in, Candace. I really enjoyed chatting with you every time we chatted, but today as well. All right. Well, take care, listeners. And thanks again. It's great to see each of you growing. I always continue to seek your feedback. And please definitely reach out at kernelcandid.com. You can Get me there. Send me an email at kernelcandidate at gmail.com. Any topics that just struck a chord today or things you'd like me to dive into, guests that you think would be great to be on this show, I am always open for feedback. But today is definitely one of those. I will have all of Mel's information in our show notes. And thanks for listening. <laughs>